Sure, it's not a big deal. And you can probably see with my sister too. That's nice. Okay, bye. Welcome to the ARCO Forum at the Kennedy School of Government. On behalf of the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy, the Taubman Center, and the Hauser Center, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, um, Bob Putnam, talking about his research and his new book. Bob is the Peter and Isabel Malkin Professor of Public Policy here at the Kennedy School and at Harvard's Department of Government. Uh, he's also former dean of the Kennedy School. Uh, and uh, has done his administrative duty and is now able to settle back into serious, serious scholarship, which is, go uh, which is Bob's great love. He is a prolific scholar. He's authored more than 10 books and 30 scholarly works. One of my favorite books of Bob's is his book, Making Democracy Work, Civic Traditions in Modern Italy. If you haven't read it, you should read it right after you read Bowling Alone. And he received the ultimate praise for this book, as one of my colleagues said, wouldn't you love to get a comment like this on your work, from the economist that described it as uh, a great work of social science worthy to rank alongside de Tocqueville, Pareto, and Weber. And in fact, <laughs> that's the tradition that Bob is continuing. Many of us in various fields of social policy scholarship have watched what seemed to be a decline in community, an increase in professionalization, a sense of dislocation, and many aspects of public policy, many fields are beginning to look at ways of how we can restore the sense of community. But we've often looked at it from a specific angle, a specific field of social policy. What Bob has done is pulled across the broader question. He's asked us about what does it mean to see a community decline. He's thought it, taught, gotten us to think about civic engagement, and he's gotten us to think once again about the concept of social capital. This is all culminated in his recent book, Bowling Alone, which Bob is going to talk about tonight and other things. Thanks very much. It's, uh, it's terrific to be here with you tonight again in the forum. Um, I spoke here about five years ago, uh, early in the project that has produced the book Bowling Alone. And so, in a sense, what I want to do tonight is to report to friends and colleagues on what I've been doing recently in the last five years. Um, and I want to talk about four basic questions. First of all, what's been happening to community, or what I call social capital, in America over the last generation or so? Two, because the answer to the first question will be it's down. Two, why? Three, so what? Does it matter? And four, what can we do about it? Uh, but I want to begin by just saying a word or two about this concept of social capital, which has, uh, plays an important role in my work. Um, social capital simply refers to the fact, it's drawn by analogy with other forms of capital, like physical capital. Physical capital is simply some physical object like a screwdriver that makes you more productive than you would otherwise be. Uh, and about 25 years ago, economists began talking about human capital to refer to the fact that training and education can also make us more productive. So you save up your money and you invest in education. And you, the same you, are more productive than you would be if you didn't have that training and education. And social capital simply refers to the fact that there are features of our communities that are like that. That is, you, the same you, with the same tools, the same physical capital, and the same education, the same human capital, can be more productive in some sorts of communities or some sorts of organizations than you would be in an organization or in a community where there wasn't 
a network of social connectedness and a, and, a, and a norm of trust and reciprocity. And social capital simply refers to the fact, in other words, that social networks have value. They have value for the people who are in them. There are lots of examples of that. I'm going to talk about some more examples of it later this evening, but one that is important to all of us is that most people in this room, including me, uh, got their jobs more through whom they know than through what they know. I'm not talking about um, nepotism, I'm just talking about the fact that most of us learn about our jobs through some kind of connections. There's even an economist at the University of Chicago, that's where you'd expect it would be, who's calculated the dollar value of your Rolodex, which turns out to be, for everybody in this room, quite high. Uh, actually, for most of us, the dollar value of, I hate to say this, as to the, especially the Kennedy School students here, but the dollar value of your Rolodex is a lot greater than the dollar value of your, all of your degrees. Um, which is to say social capital has cash value. Now, it has all sorts of other values that I'm going to talk about later, but the main point I want to make is social networks have real value. They have value not just to the people who are in them, and this is what makes social capital especially interesting. Social capital also, that is social networks, also have value for the bystanders, so to speak, the people who are not directly in the network. Again, there are many examples of how networks, social networks, have value for people who are not directly in them. Um, one of them is, uh, just to give a personal example, um, uh, my wife Rosemary and I live in Lexington. We live in a community in which there's a, a lot of connectedness. People have picnics and barbecues and so on. And we know perfectly well uh, that uh, social networks is a, are a strong predictor of low crime rates. The best predictor of crime is, for example, how many neighbors know one another's first name. So because of the social networks um, in our little neighborhood in Next Lexington, Rosemary and I are both able to be here tonight quite confident that our house is not going to be broken into because of all the social capital on our, on our, uh, in our neighborhood. Now, that's true even though, and it's now a time for true confession, I actually don't myself go to those picnics and barbecues. I spend most of my time on the road. Rosemary sometimes goes, but I'm a complete free rider with respect to the social capital. But nevertheless, I can benefit from it. And so all I've really just finished saying is that social networks have externalities. They have benefits for people who are not necessarily in them. One of the reasons that social networks have these external effects is that social networks turn out to be empirically associated with norms of reciprocity. And reciprocity simply means I'll do this for you now without expecting anything immediately back from you because down the road he'll do something for me and you'll do something for him and we're all connected. Norm of reciprocity is enormously valuable. I know that's sort of a, a, a $10 word. I, it, actually, the best definition of, of uh, of social capital comes from a philosopher in, in New York City that some of you will have heard of, Yogi Berra, um, who said, if you don't go to somebody's funeral, they won't come to yours. <laughs> and actually, if you think about it, there's a deep, um, there's a lot, of, a lot to that, as there is to a lot of things that Yogi says. And, and what it captures is this idea of reciprocity and the, the notion of doing for other people without expecting immediate returns turns out to be an enormously efficient social mechanism. Because it's like cash as opposed to barter. If you had to balance every trade instantly, as you do in a barter system, you can't be nearly as efficient as if you can kind of, you know, vaguely keep track of, of who, of, you know, doing to others and so on. So social capital simply refers to the fact that connections have value, they have value for the people who are in them, and they have value for the people who are bystanders. About five years, six years ago, I began being curious about what were the trends in social capital in the United States. Now, if you think about it, there's an interesting methodological issue here. Actually, I ask you to sort of put yourself in this quandary. How would you know whether there had been changes in social capital, in social networks, in norms of reciprocity and so on over time in the United States. Um, well, one, what, you want real evidence, right? Because you don't want to be sort of trying to remember what was life, life was like 25 or 30 or 40 years ago. Even if you could, you wouldn't necessarily trust your own memory. 
So you'd like to have some kind of harder measure of how things used to be. And one way to begin with is to use the record keeping that is embodied in club or organizational membership. Now, organizational membership is not the only form of social capital. I want to emphasize that. It has a particular advantage because club secretaries all over the country have been keeping club membership records for a long time. So I thought, let's look at trends in organizational uh, membership. And more recently, and I'm now just about to begin the first slide, um, Dim the lights. Is the mic on? Can you hear me up there? Yeah. Okay. Um, if we can dim the lights. What this graph shows is trends in organizational membership in the United States over the course of the 20th century. What we did was to ask for many different organizations, not just how many members they had over time, but what fraction of the people that could belong to an organization did. That is, what fraction of Jewish women over the course of the 20th century belonged to Hadassah? What fraction of uh, rural youth belonged to the 4-H? What fraction of parents belonged to the PTA? And the reason, of course, we ask it that way is because we didn't want to have the ups and downs of membership turn on just how many parents there were. We wanted to know what fraction of parents belonged to the PTA or what fraction of men belonged to one of the animal clubs, that is, men's organizations. Um, <laughs> that's a technical term. Um, it refers to the fact, I didn't realize this until I did this research, actually, that all men's organizations in America are named for animals. The Lions Club and the Moose Club and the Elks Club and the Eagles Club and so on. So we asked of all those men's organ, all the animal clubs, what fraction of men belong to one of the animal clubs? What fraction of, uh, I, you know, Catholic men belong to uh, the Knights of Columbus and so on for lots of different organizations. This graph, I think, says 32. In the end, we looked at, oh, about 45 different organizations. What fraction of all doctors belong to the AMA? What fraction of all electrical and electronic engineers belong to the IEEE, and so on. And the graph actually, this graph is kind of an average of all those trends, but it turns out that almost every organization has the same pattern, so the average doesn't distort things very much. And what you see is that for the first two-thirds of the 20th century, year by year, every year, a higher and higher fraction of people belong to one of these organizations. And because, of course, population was growing, absolute numbers of members were rising steadily. There's only one exception to that. You can see it very clearly. Between 1930 and 1935, there's a sharp drop. Many organizations in America lost half their members in the five years between 1930 and 1935. Uh, the uh, the uh, League of Women Voters, Masons, lost half their members. The Big Depression had a huge, disastrous effect on community connectedness in America. But then coming out of the Depression, and especially the, 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 the period after World War II, basically from 1945 to 1965, probably the greatest period of civic activism in American history. Basically, not just in terms of level, but in terms of the trend, most organizations doubled their market share in the 20 years between 1945 and 1965. And of course, because you know that was also the period of the baby boom, the, the underlying base, the number of people who could belong, was growing also. So if you look at PTA membership, for example, it just skyrockets. It, it uh, quadruples over that same period. Huge changes. Everything was going up until suddenly, silently, mysteriously, unnoticed at first. All of those organizations began to experience leveling market share and then slumping market share and then plunging market share. Now, of course, club, member, club secretaries don't keep track of market share. They keep track of club members. And so for a while, the growing number of people masked the fact that a market share was falling. But then gradually, clubs began, organizations of all sorts, began to notice that their absolute number of members was falling. And every, every organization had exactly the same first reaction, bad program chair last year. And then the second reaction, then they changed program chair, and then they all had the same reaction in the second year, which was our due structure must be too high. But if you sort of step back and see this happening all over America, you must say to yourself, well, what are the odds that every organization in America got a bad program chair at the same time? Not likely. So something else must be, must be happening. Not every organization hit the wall, hit the peak at the same time. Uh, the earliest organizations to hit their maximum in terms of market share were the 
uh, General Federation of Women's Clubs in 1957, and the AMA, actually, American Medical Association in 1958, uh, reached their peak. The last organization to reach the peak in terms of market share was appropriately the Optimists. Um, they they uh, peaked in 1980, but then they just plunged and fell off the, the edge of the table, and they're now down where we are in terms of numbers of, uh, in terms of market share. And so I believe that graph captures reasonably well the long-term trends over the course of the 20th century in patterns of social involvement, social connectedness in American communities. But you should now be saying to yourself, wait a minute, Bob. There are at least two reasons why what you've just said is not substantiated by the evidence that you've shown us. There are at least two reasons why these trends in organizational membership don't prove that, that the ups and downs of social capital followed that same trend. First, I've been looking here at Organ the same organizations over a 100-year period. They've only, I, all these organizations that I've looked at have been around for most of the 20th century. Maybe those were the old-fashioned organizations, the funny hat organizations. So maybe all this shows is that a certain set of organizations got tired or got obsolete or something. And maybe there was another whole new set of organizations springing up, you know, new age reading groups or, or self-help groups or whatever that were replacing these groups, but they were sort of flying beneath Putnam's radar. So maybe this graph just shows that it's possible for some organizations to get old-fashioned, but not that joining per se was down. And then secondly, you would say, leave aside the question of organizations. You've only looked at organizational membership, but you told us that social capital was about social networks not just organized networks, but informal networks. So maybe people had stopped going to organizations, even maybe going to organizations at all, but maybe they're connecting in other sorts of informal ways. Maybe they're going to bars more often. Maybe they're, I mean, after all, Cheers, the bar where everybody knows your name, that's pure social capital. I mean, it, it, it isn't really because it's just a TV program, but I mean, you could imagine, you could imagine a bar where you, where you connect and, um, or, uh, you know, maybe we're, we're hanging out with friends more, just having people over the house, or maybe we're going on picnics more, or I don't know, what, some other informal things. Now, it wasn't what, five years ago when I last reported to you, I didn't talk about any of those things, not because I didn't realize the potential that we were connecting in informal ways, but I couldn't figure out where the National Picnic Registry was kept. That is, I couldn't figure out how would we know whether we were going on picnics more or fewer picnics or more fewer trips to the corner bar or whatever. And then the most exciting thing that's ever happened to, well, the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me professionally uh, happened. I, I discovered two new data sets. Right, I mean, I actually do get excited about data. That's, that's how you know that I'm a, I'm a uh, scholar. And I would like to convince you that these two data sets are also really neat. Um, the first of them comes from a set of monthly surveys. Every month for the last 25 years, the Roper Organization has been asking Americans all over America, a couple thousand people, people every month, a whole series of questions about their profile of civic involvement. Let me, I mean, just actually, let me ask you these questions so you get a sense of, of the questions. How many people, just think, of, think over the last 12 months. Have you, in the course of the last 12 months, been to any public meeting where there was a discussion of town or school affairs. I don't mean a town meeting, I mean just any public meeting where people talked about local affairs. Tonight counts, but leave aside tonight. How, I'm, let's see your hands. How many people here have, in the course of the last 12 months, been to any public meeting where there was a discussion of local affairs? Okay, this is a pretty civic group, um, actually approaching off scale. Um, <laughs> Okay, let me ask a different question. How many of you in the course of the last 12 months have been either an officer or a committee member of any local organization? Now, not just one of the old-fashioned old funny hat organizations, but new age economy groups, a new age poetry groups count here. So how many of you have been an officer or a committee member of any local organization in the last 12 months? Whoa, this is off scale. Okay, I'm, I'm beginning to get intimidated. So <laughs> keep your hands down, but I'll illustrate some of the other, other questions. Um, 
have you in the course of the last 12 months signed a petition? Have you in the don't raise your hands. Have you in the course of the last 12 months um, run for office? Have you in the course of the last 12 months uh, been to any political meeting or, or, or rally? Have you in the course of the last 12 months uh, written a letter to the editor and so on? 12 different measures of different forms of civic engagement. Now remember, we've got every month, month by month, 25 years, basically there's, uh, in round numbers, this is nearly half a million people. So these are really pretty good measures of, the, of a wide range of forms of connectedness. And I can summarize all of the evidence from this survey, this enormous archive, very simply, down a lot, or, or as the Vice President will probably, or Vice President tonight will probably say, down big time. Um, let's have the next graph. This is answers to the question, have you in the course of the last 12 months, um, is it possible to bring the lights down a little bit more? Um, have you in the, thank you, that's great. Now I can read the graph. Have you in the course of the last 12 months uh, been to any public meeting? This is the public meeting question. And what you can see is that in 1973, um, about 22% uh, of Americans had been to some public meeting in the previous 12 months. By 1994, that's the last number on this graph, although the graph continues down more recently than that, that was down to about 12%. So about a 50% decline over this period in the number of times anybody in America had been to any public meeting where people talked about local affairs. You can see that it's, it's now down to about one in 10 Americans have been in any given year to any public meeting about local affairs. So since that number was in this room sort of 30 or 40%, that's what I meant when I said this is a, an off-scale room. Uh, let's have the next graph. This is answers to that question about have you been an officer or a committee member of any local organization in the last 12 months, and you can see that uh, in 1973, that was about 10, 12, 14, 16, 17% uh, of Americans in 1974, 17% of Americans had been some kind of uh, organiza local organization leader, and that number has fallen now, well, even as recently as 1994, that was down to, to uh, 8%, and it's continued to fall since then. So more than roughly a 60% decline in the frequency with which people had been an officer of any local organization, not just one of the old-fashioned organizations. So this is the first bit of evidence that, in fact, it wasn't just the old funny hat organizations that were losing members. It was all sorts of organizations that were dropping. And as you can see, that's now basically one in every 12 Americans have been in that way involved, and that number was about uh, in this room, it was about 60% of you. So you can see that probably this is the most civic room in America at this, at this moment. You are really, really not typical. Um, but across America as a whole, basically all of these numbers are down. All of these forms of civic engagement are down. They're not all down by the same amount. The things that you, the forms of connectedness that you could conceivably engage in alone, like writing a letter to an editor or running for office, those are all down by about 10%. The things you, you couldn't conceivably do alone, you could not go to a meeting alone, because if you go to a meeting and there's no one else there, it's not a meeting. If you or, or belong to, a, you know, being a, the president of a club, if you're the president of a club and it has no other members, not a club. And those things that require somebody else to do it with you are all down by about 40, 50, or 60%. So it's a little bit, a little bit as if we've all pulled back a little bit from forms of connectedness, but the things we would do together, we've pulled back from a lot. That is, however, not the most interesting of the forms of, of, the, of the two archives. The, the other archive, uh, th whose existence I didn't even know of at the last time that I spoke with you, uh, is an archive that comes from a marketing firm in Chicago, the DDB um, marketing company. Um, I learned about the existence of this uh, archive totally by accident, um, but it is a really neat, I think it's actually one of the most important sources of systematic evidence on social change in America in existence. It, basically, every year since 1975, the DDB Corporation has gathered a large survey of Americans, uh, mainly their consumer habits. Do you, do you, how much, you know, do you eat yogurt, and if so, yo play or Dan, and uh, how do you feel about Ad Nike versus Adidas, you know, greeting cards and so on. But they had the idea, beginning 25 years ago, that if you're writing an ad for yogurt, it would be useful to know something about yogurt eaters besides the fact that they ate yogurt, because you know, you're writing an ad, you want to have something in your mind about who are, the, who are yogurt eaters. So they thought, let's learn a little bit about the lifestyle of these people. I mean, do yogurt eaters also ski or, or not? Do they bowl or not? Do they, you know, do they jog or not? And so they began asking, the, the DDB folks, this large sample of Americans every year 
for the last 25 years and counting, a whole series of questions that had the following, most of them had the following form. How many times last year did you go to church? They had the idea. Uh, Hallmark is one of their big clients, and they had the idea correctly that people who go to church often are more likely to send greeting cards. How many times last year did you go to a club meeting? How many times last year uh, did you volunteer? How many times last year did you work on a community project? How many times last year did you have friends over to the house? How many times last year did you give the finger to another driver? How many times... Did you know what I meant by that? I wasn't sure whether this audience would, would know what I meant by that. Actually, that's a kind of an interesting datum. Um, sorry, this is a little bit off topic, but it's, it's not off color, but it's off topic. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, also in the survey are questions about uh, tax evasion. And uh, by far, the best predictor, in the, out of the thousands of variables in this data set, the best predictor of who cheats on their income taxes is the number of times you gave the finger to another driver. <laughs> I have a neat idea, actually, for the IRS. Um, a camera out there at, uh, on Route 2, uh, which would either increase the efficiency of the auditing or at least improve the civility of pe people on driving in, on driving in from Concord and, and Lexington. Um, uh, okay, other, other questions. How many times last year uh, did you uh, go to a bar? How many times last year did you have friends over the house? How many times last year um, did you go on a picnic? Picnics. I'd found the National Picnic Registry, um, and I can therefore tell you uh, that, uh, as long as you kind of keep it to yourself, that uh, in 1975, the average American went on five picnics. Uh, last year, 1999, the average American went on two picnics. There's been a 60% a, a decline in picnic going in America. I thought that would knock your socks off. Um, and you're saying to yourself, is he actually going to try to tell us that going to picnics, the future of American civilization depends on going, on going to picnics? And the answer is yes, actually. In a minute, I am going to try to tell you that. But um, how many times last year, how often did you have dinner with your own family? That's the kind of question to ask. This data set, in other words, provides a very rich account of trends in, our, in all various forms of social connection, not just the formal organizational membership that's uh, formal organizational involvement that's involved in membership records but also all these other informal ways of connecting and i can summarize the trends in social connectedness measured in the uh, ddb surveys very simply down all of them big time let's try to try i want to try to be brief here so let me just go through a couple of examples of from that let's have the next graph uh, this is how many times did you go to a club meeting last year in 1975 the average american went to 12 club meetings conveniently once a month by 1999, last year, the average American went to five club meetings, a decline of about 60% in the frequency of club meetings. Um, it's not only in, in clubs that social capital is embodied, it's also embodied, and, and maybe especially embodied in religious participation as a rough rule of thumb. Half of all social capital in America is religious, half of all clubs are, I mean, organizational memberships in America are religious, half of all volunteering, half of all philanthropy is religious, so it matters a lot. And we can look at the next graph, I think, will show you what the trends in church going as one measure of religious involvement look like. Over the, This begins in 1940 because there were some early surveys by Gallup. It, this is based on a number of different uh, survey archives. And what it shows is basically the same kind of rise in the period after World War II. People started going to church more after World War II. Uh, rise to about the same period, about 1960, 65, and then this long-term slump of a decline of about 25%. Those numbers, I should say, um, there's some, this is a methodological uh, footnote. Those numbers may somewhat understate the total decline in religious participation. Understated, because sociologists have recently taken to doing a kind of interesting study. They ask people the standard question, did you go to church last Sunday? And then they check to see, were you actually in the pews? And there are two interesting findings from this research. Uh, first of all, lots of, us, lots of us misremember as to whether it was last Sunday that we were in church. And secondly, there's some evidence that we're mis misremembering more than our parents did in response to the same question. So if you go to church now, there are more phantoms sitting beside you in the pews. That is, more people who think they're there but really aren't. And that means that these measures of, of, of reported church attendance probably understate the decline in religious involvement. So far, I've only been talking about formal organizations, clubs and churches and so on, but this survey, the DDB archive, also allows us to look at changes in informal forms of connection. Let's have the next graph. 
this is um, how many, this is just how many times did you have friends over to the house? I don't mean a formal dinner party, but just how many times last year did you have friends over to the house? That number was 14 times a year in 1975 across America as a whole. It's now down to about eight. So what we're beginning to see is it's not just informal organizational do-gooding studies. We're just not connecting with friends and neighbors. The trend down in picnics is totally replicated in terms of there's been a decline of about 35 or 40 percent in the frequency with which Americans go to bars uh, and similar declines and all those other, other kinds of informal measures that I talked about before. Um, the, most, the single most striking, to me personally, surprising uh, uh, change measured in this data actually is this next graph which asks how often do you have dinner with your own family? Um, could we have the next graph please? There. The red lines coming down are the number of people in America over the year by year who said we always have dinner with our family. The dark blue line are the people who say well we usually have dinner in our family. And the light blue line are the people who say actually we never have dinner in our, together in our family. Now this was a very helpful graph because it's, it's true actually in our family that we have dinner together more rarely than we used to, but I was able to say to Rosemary, now actually it's not me, honey, it's us, it's all of us that are not having dinner together as a family. Um, and, and yet, if you think about it, and I'm now being serious for a second, that graph is actually a stunning record of a change in a very fundamental form of social behavior in America, a, a social behavior period. Uh, human beings have been having dinner, have been breaking bread together with their uh, primary family for a long time. That's a deep social pattern, and the fact that there's been such a decline over this period is really quite striking. Um, okay, there are, uh, that's the last slide I'm going to uh, give. I want to um, now summarize for you very briefly what I've said so far. There's been a substantial decline in social connectedness in America in all forms, a decline in uh, formal involvement, a decline in informal involvement. I didn't show you the graph for social trust, but a decline, a substantial decline in social trust. Really, Americans in many different ways have become disengaged from formal community institutions and from uh, informal ways from our family and, and friends and neighbors. Now the question, the last three questions I want to ask, I'm going to be a little briefer about because these are questions that I want to engage you with. Um, why? Uh, so what? And um, what can we do about it? Can I ask you just briefly now to help me with the question of why? This turns out to be, I don't know how many of you have uh, seen the mystery murder on the Orient Express in which the answer to the question who done it was everybody done it, or at least there were multiple assailants. So this is a mystery like that. This is a mystery in which there turn out to be multiple culprits. But what I want to know is who should we put in the lineup? That is, what factors do you think might contribute to the long, this long-term slump over the last 35, 40 years in forms of connectedness, formal and informal? Uh, just speak out. Uh, just, you know, one or two or three words so that I get some sense of wh what should be in the lineup. What are the possible answers to the question why? Technology. Work. Microwavable food. TV. Working women. Shopping malls. The automobile. Worker mobility. Worker mobility meaning workers changing jobs a lot? Moving a lot from place to place. Okay, others? Money. More money means less. Let me, okay, good. Let me, there are, there are other examples. I can exonerate a few of the suspects you've named. I know that if we had longer, you'd have a chance, you'd, have, you'd come up with other suspects. I can exonerate a few and I can indict a few. Uh, I, we're, we'll have a time, I'm trying to leave time for us to have some discussion to see, sort out these causes, but let me exonerate a couple. Money is probably not a major factor here, and I, there are two reasons for my saying that. One is, that long boom of civic life was a period of very rapid economic growth. So we were getting, from 1945 to 1965, every year we were getting richer and richer and more and more involved. And moreover, the trends down in civic engagement are remarkably true in every seg segment of American society. The trends are down among men and down among women and down among rich folks and down among poor folks and down among PhDs and down among high school dropouts and down among African Americans and down among whites and down among in the suburbs and down in the central cities and so on. So this is not a trend that seems somehow to be unique to 
people who are relatively better off. The other suspect that I can, uh, that I can exonerate, actually, although I originally thought it was a prime suspect, is mobility, moving around a lot. Because it, it is true that moving around a lot causes you to not be so connected with your community, but actually we're moving a lot less, less now than people were 50 years ago. Geographic mobility, residential mobility, has been steadily, year by year, declining for 50 years. Declining. Uh, when our parents and grandparents were being as civically involved as they were up at the peak, they were moving more often than we are now. So we can exonerate residential mobility. But many of the other suspects you named, I think, are indictable. Um, I'll say, let me take, for example, the case of, of working women that someone here measured, uh, mentioned. Um, Actually, I have to be careful at this point. My daughter, who's a professional woman and, and, uh, and a mom, tells me that I have to be really careful in how I phrase this in order not to leave you with the impression that she personally is responsible for the decline and fall of American uh, civilization. But it is true that um, as women have moved into the labor force, um, basically our, people of my age, our moms were social capitalists, were doing social capital work. Our wives and our daughters are doing other great things, and we guys haven't picked up the slack. That is a part of the story, but it's a very small part of the story. It's not by any means the total story. It's maybe, I'm guessing, 10%, maybe 20% of the total problem. It's not the major factor. Um, mobility in cars, not, not residential mobility, but cars, and especially urban sprawl, is another important part of the story. I didn't think that it was. I, when I spoke with you five years ago, I didn't think this was a suspect at all. But there turns out to be a very simple regularity. It's quite general, actually. You can just file this away, every 10 minutes more of additional commuting time means 10% less of every form of social connection. 10 minutes more commuting time means 10% less church going, 10% fewer dinner parties, 10% fewer voting, 10% less public meetings, club memberships, and so on. So sprawl matters. Um, television is an important part of the story, too. Uh, it's actually a bigger part of the story than the factors I've mentioned so far. Uh, there's sorting out you know, whether television is just a symptom of the problem or actually a cause of the problem is somewhat complicated because we've not yet done experimental studies in which we forced some people to watch television and forced other people not to watch uh, television. That would certainly never get by the Human Subjects Review Board uh, at Harvard, although it's not clear whether the greater outcry would, would come on behalf of the people who were forced to watch television or the people who were forced not to watch television. But in any event, um, short of that kind of experimental study, it's quite clear that the, the average American watches four hours of entertainment television, uh, 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 four hours. If you don't watch four hours, somebody else out there is picking up your share. And actually, watching Jim Lehrer is great for your civic health, but most of us don't. Um, watching uh, uh, Survivor, thank you, um, is actually, it may be fun, but it's awful for your civic involvement. Uh, watching friends tends to keep you from having friends. Um, and in general, entertainment television is le lethal, lethal to social engagement. And in fact, most of us are now watching television alone. We're not even sitting around the electronic hearth. Um, do you, did you see this recent statistic? It's an amazing fact. Of, peep, of, of, of um, seventh graders in America, 70% of seventh graders in America have their own television. And 95% of all watching of television by kids is done without any other adult present. Uh, this is it, the degree to which we are dependent upon television for entertainment is really quite striking. So television is part of the problem. And then finally, and very importantly, there are big generational differences here. For some reason, what Tom Bo Brokaw calls the greatest generation, that is the um, uh, lo the long civic, what I call the long civic generation, uh, people my people born and raised before or during World War II is uh, really are much more civic than their children and grandchildren. And for some reason, they didn't pass those, those habits along. Um, that's a sketch, although I'm delighted to, to, during the Q&A to have a chance to talk about other possible reasons for this uh, trend down. Let me lastly uh, say a couple of words about the two final questions. One is, so what? Does it matter that there's been this decline in civic engagement? And since I'll argue that it does, finally, what do we do about it? Does it matter? Uh, it matters in many measurable ways. This is not a matter of warm, cuddly feelings. Schools don't work as well in communities where parents are not involved. Crime rates are higher where people don't connect with their neighbors. Your health is strongly affected by your social connections. I mean, controlling for your blood chemistry 
and your age and your gender, all, and whether you jog and smoke and so on, all the standard risk factors, your chances of dying, actually your chances of dying are high, but your chances of dying over the next year are cut in half by joining one group, cut in two, three quarters by joining two groups. If you, as a risk factor, social isolate for health, for, for dying, social isolation as a causal risk factor is as big a risk factor for ill health as smoking. If you smoke and belong to no groups, it's a close call. Um, I'm not saying you should smoke. I'm saying social isolation is demonstrably bad for your health. There are many other examples of that, but let me close by asking, or at least trying to frame the question, what can we do about this decline in social connection? Um, I don't know for sure what to do about it, but I want to put this in some historical context. If you go back 100 years ago to America at the end of the, 20, at the, end of the 19th century, they had a it was a period very, very like our own. It was a period in which, or in the, in the period between 19, 1880 and, and uh, 1900, there had been a period of rapid technological progress, rapid economic growth. America was feeling really pretty proud of itself and pretty satisfied in economic terms, although then as now, there was a growing gap between rich and poor. Um, but the most striking and relevant thing was then as now, all that social and economic change had rendered obsolete a stock of social capital. All that I mean by that in, the, in that period was that as people, during the Industrial Revolution with urbanization and immigration, when people moved from the village to the city, when they moved from the shtetl to the Lower East Side, or when they moved from Iowa to Chicago, they left their friends and family behind in, in the farm. And America, at the end of the 19th century, suffered from all of the same symptoms of a social capital deficit that we do today. If you could, it is amazing, reading accounts of that period, how much it felt like now. We felt great about our economic prospects. We knew that we were going to live better than our parents had, but we felt that we didn't connect with one another as they had. Walter Lippmann said we changed, we changed things faster than we knew how to change ourselves. And if you'd been around then, it would have been tempting to say, you know, life in some sense was much nicer back on the farm. Everybody back to the farm, please. But that's not what they did. Instead, they fixed the problem in a very short period of time by amazing civic inventiveness. Look at the founding dates of most of the major civic institutions in American life today. Most of them were founded in about 20 years at the turn of the last century. The Boy Scouts and the Red Cross and the League of Women Voters and the NAACP and the Urban League and the Knights of Columbus and Hadassah and Rotary and Kiwanis and community foundations and community chess, which became the United Way. It's hard to name most labor unions. It's hard to name a major civic institution in American life today that was not invented. Now. Just as they didn't say, back to the farm where life was nicer, I'm not saying, and the thing that has actually most concerned me about the debate about bowling alone is some people thought I was saying, life was much nicer back in the 50s. Would all women please report to the kitchen and turn off the television? And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need a period of civic inventiveness like the period of the progressive era. That's what I'm talking about, the transition from the Gilded Age to the progressive era. I, I don't mean that we need to invent new organizations necessarily. I mean we have to have a concentrated period in which we reweave the fabric of our communities. That may involve changes in schools. It may, it almost certainly will involve changes in the structure of work, so fit our work lives and our family life and community life together better. It may very well involve uh, use of the internet. It may involve lots of ideas, and I'm eager to hear your ideas about how we might fix this problem. Um, meanwhile, you've been an extremely attentive audience, and I'm looking forward to dealing with your listening to and dealing with your questions and, answer, and my, trying to provide some answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. We have four microphones, two on this floor and two up above. And what we'll do is take questions from each mic. I'd like to ask you to uh, give us your name and ask a brief question. And for those of you who are in the mics up there, it's sometimes hard for us to see you. So if we're missing you, um, yell. Bob. Hi. Hi. My name is Justin Porter. And I was going to ask about perhaps military service as a causal factor. Um, you saw that it, it came to a, a head right at the end of 
1955-1960, when all of the people that had served in World War II and had relatively good experiences with the military, um, and then their children as well, people born in before or during World War II, as opposed to those that participated in Vietnam in that era, and perhaps as a solution now, um, some sort of national service um, that everyone would participate in where they would be a part of an institution. Right. And you know, so. Um, extremely good question. Um, it certainly does appear to be the case that American, that civic life, community connectedness in American history has been associated with, has been encouraged by war. Uh, and military service. It isn't, I think, I've looked carefully at the specific question of whether military service itself was the determining factor in, in World War II, for example, and I can't find any evidence that veterans, as opposed to people who were around but not veterans, I can't find any evidence that veterans were, are, were particularly more likely to be engaged, but it certainly is true that people who lived through the war are more engaged. Uh, this is not only my own research, research that Theda Scotchpole, a sociologist here at Harvard, has done, also suggests the same story. And, and yet, of course, you do, would not want to say, well, okay, great, Putnam has told us the solution is a great world war. That'd be a nice way to rebuild American communities. This is not unique to us because when the folks of the progressive era were focused on the same question that, that we are tonight, that is how to rebuild c community, they came to the same point, they stood at exactly this point in the argument, and they realized that war and military service was a builder of social connectedness. They called, they called it community. Um, and William James wrote an essay, some of you will have heard of it, all of you have heard of the label, but you will, some of you know the essay, called The Moral Equivalent of War. And the, the, the essay, The Moral Equivalent of War, meant can we find a moral equivalent to the role that war plays in building connectedness? It's a remarkable essay because it re it's readable today in exactly those same terms because what he said was national service is the moral equivalent of war. I don't say that to say to sort of end the argument by saying, well, William James said it, so it must be right. I am saying it is quite astonishing that people who went through the same kind of thinking process that we are came to the conclusion that national service was part of the solution. And I recognize that there are a lot of pros and cons about required national service and so on, but, and, but I do think that um, national service would have an effect of building a greater sense of community. Um, the evidence on volunteerism and service learning in high schools and colleges now is the, there's a growing amount of evidence, including some just, just as recently as this month, a new study that has come out that has shown that those Participation in those kinds of activities does have enduring effects. People matching, matching on a lot of other characteristics, people who've been through those, those sorts of programs are more civically involved years afterwards. So I think the evidence is that, um, I don't know that I'd be prepared at this point to go all the way to a you know, full dress national service, because I think it'd be, frankly, at this point, so controversial that it might distract us from other things. But I do think that dramatically increasing service learning in our high schools and in our colleges, which is the first step toward that, is a, a, proved, a proven solution or a proven approach to a, this problem. So I agree with that. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Andrew Lee. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, Professor Putnam, I wanted to ask you a question that came up in a review that Francis Fukuyama had in the uh, Washington Post of your book, um, in which he said that, that as, essentially what might be happening is a change in the form of associ associationalism um, with the rise of, of association uh, through internet groups. But I'm also wondering if the internet changes the way in which existing groups get together, so perhaps they don't have as many meetings and they don't have offices, um, but they, they're there's still groups and there's still a form of associationalism going on. Um, I want to distinguish two forms of that question. That is, to what extent did the internet either cause the problem, which is some version of this, or to what, is it simply that people have moved offline or online for their community involvement? Leave that, that's one's question. That is, is the internet in some way implicated in the long run trends that I'm talking about? And a separate question is, could the internet be part of the solution to our problems? Because the answer to the first question is unequivocally that the internet had nothing to do with the downtrends that I've talked about because all of these trends were well underway 20 years before Bill Gates, you know, was at Harvard. That is, in other words, or before anybody thought of the internet. What I'm trying to say is those trends have been steadily down for 
20, 25 years, long before the internet. So the internet comes into the story very late and can't be very much of the story. It is a separate question, though, whether the internet could be riding the rescue. Was the internet going to help the problem, improve the problem, as you're suggesting by online you know, chat groups or whatever? Or is it going to make the problem worse? And there's another set of arguments that one could make that the internet is actually going to be, make the problem worse. I think this is an important question, absolutely worthy of discussion. I think the question of whether it is the explanation for the decline is a red herring, frankly. I mean, it's, it's off topic. But I think that the issue about whether, whether we can make the internet part of the solution rather than, rather than part of the problem is an important one. It's a big question because it's hard to actually, it turns out to be hard to project the effects of technology. People in a similar stage in the development of the telephone, for example, there's, as you may know, there's been people have looked back at projections about the social effects of the telephone, and people like me, pundits then, were utterly, and like Frank Fukuyama, for that matter, were utterly wrong in their guesses about the long-run effects of the telephone. So I'm a little, I think you should take with many grains of salt what any of us say about what we think the long-run effect of the, of the internet will be. But I think the question fundamentally is whether the internet will turn out to be in effect, a nifty telephone or a nifty TV. And I think there's still an open question. By nifty telephone, I mean a way of deepening and strengthening and um, broadening our connections with other people, which is what you're suggesting. And I think that's possible. It certainly has that potential in it. Or whether it will turn out to be yet another glowing box that we fundamentally sit in front of and for passive entertainment. And I can tell you a story about those two futures. And then, uh, which I won't take time to, but I want to. But I want to. You could you could tell a story in both those futures. The only concern I and and basically in our, in our research program here at the Kennedy School, we're spending a fair amount of time trying to make trying to think about how you would evolve the tele technology in ways that would make it more like a nifty telephone. However, if you think about the social implications of the dot com stock revolution for a moment, are think about what that means. I, I'm not opposed to this, but. The dot-com stock market boom means that America is investing several hundreds of billions of dollars now in attracting smart people to work on fundamentally the task of making the internet a nifty television rather than a nifty telephone. I don't object to that, but I do think that this, by relying solely on market techniques for allocating, market mechanisms, I mean, for allocating investment, we are risking undervaluing the potential community-friendly dimensions of the internet. So I would actually favor, you didn't ask me this, but I would favor substantial public investment, actually, in, in um, uh, enabling, in sort of fostering community-friendly forms of the internet. And that's a long answer to a question that deserves an even longer answer. So we'll come, talk, come and talk, we'll talk about it later. Yes, uh, let's go up there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ari Weinstein. I'm a junior in the college. Um, I wanted to ask you some more about the telephone. Yep. Over the last 35 years, there's been an incredible increase in telephone usage. And I was wondering how much social capital you think that has built and whether that might account for or make up for some of the loss that you've noted in your graphs. Um, there has been a growth, although it's not been incredible. It's been a continuation of the same trend that was true in the last, uh, that the trend in telephone usage actually is essentially linear. Uh, upward, of course, but linear uh, over the last 60 or 70 years. Uh, in other words, it was rising, that number was rising during the period of civic boom, and it's also been rising after civic boom. I think it's true that there have been a lot of research on the, on the social effects of the telephone. Um, basically, uh, it is true that the telephone enables us to connect a little more frequently with people that we uh, know. You don't make new friends on the telephone, for the most part. And, and th what I mean by that is it's not, it's a technique for strengthening existing connections. Actually, there's a really neat study that you may have heard of in which th it turns out that of, of, of I'm going to get these numbers I think about right, um, s of all telephone calls made from residential phones, um, about 60% are to, to other telephones within three miles of the telephone. That is to say, it doesn't turn out to have changed the fundamentally the patterns of our interaction. It's true that it's enabled us to talk to other people more frequently. Um, I don't think, however, that that has, that that in some way has uh, offset the kinds of changes that I've talked about here. Um, it isn't the same thing as having dinner with your family or uh, going to church or, um, uh, or belonging to club meetings or the other kinds of connectedness that I think have been declining.
Yes, sir. Oh, someone over there? Yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, my name's Kendra Field, and I'm an MPP1 here. Uh, my question has two parts. Um, I was thinking as you were speaking about a book called The Lost City by Alan Aaron Halt. Uh, it's a great book. And he kind of attributes, I think he attributes the decline in community to um, attitudinal changes. Yes. Um, largely um, uh, the onset of choice and individuality and anti-conformity and all of this. Yeah, and, and, then, and, de and decline of respect for authority. Right. And I'm wondering, first, do you think those that a sense of community and then those causes that he talks about are mutually exclusive? And secondly, what role does um, the change in the way you know, some positive changes in the way Americans appreciate diversity. Um, and I think those are important changes that we sure. don't want to roll back, but how do we reconcile the two? Um, I do talk about that. That's a very, very good question. Uh, and I talk about it at some length in one chapter of Bowling Alone, the book, and so I'm going to summarize extremely briefly now what I say there, but I urge you to, to take a look at it and then come talk. We can talk about it, because it's a very important set of questions. I fundamentally, the question is whether, whether the declining community is simply the flip side of the growth in tolerance and, and, and uh, respect for diversity and so on. And I think the answer to that is no, it's not. Um, one reason for saying that is that if you look across individuals or across communities in America, tolerance for diversity are positively, not negatively associated with community. That is, the most tolerant places in America are the most civically engaged. The most tolerant individuals are the most civically engaged, not the least civically engaged. There's no evidence that if we could somehow um, push down the uh, level of civic engagement in America by you know, having people stop going to club meetings, that that would in itself produce more tolerance. On the contrary, the least tolerant people in America are the least civically engaged. Middle-aged guys, middle-aged white guys like me are not very tolerant. But middle-aged white guys like me that belong to the American Legion, it turns out, are actually more tolerant than middle-aged white guys like me who don't belong to the American Legion. That is, I'm not trying to say that American Legioners are particularly tolerant of, you know, homosexuals or, or, or women or whatever, but the ones who belong are more tolerant than the ones who don't, who don't belong. So there are other reasons for that, that, cons that confirm, in my mind, this generalization. I think it is, frankly, to set our sights too low to think that we've got to choose between tolerance and connectedness. I think there's every reason to believe that we could have, actually, more connectedness without sacrificing uh, tolerance. So that's at least the way I'd address the question. Thank you for it. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Rabia Belt, and I'm a student at the college. And I thought she was going to steal my question, but you didn't exactly answer it, so okay. <laughs> I'll ask it anyway. Um, I was a little bit skeptical of the data, not in terms of the numbers, but in terms of what questions they were answering. Mm -hmm. Is the decrease in civic participation really a good indication of a decrease in social connectedness? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, I mean, 40 or 50 years ago, a lot of my choices towards um, having middle class organizations to join would be largely centered around race as a black woman. Right. Um, but now it's something where I can be a student at the college, I can have the friends and colleagues of the students in the class that I'm late to right now, and things like that. Sure. But it's not gonna show up on like my membership to the NAACP because that's not as salient to my life now as it would have been 60 right. years ago. So how exactly can that question be answered or do you sure. think that it really is answered? By that. Let me, I'm not sure I can answer, but let me try, because it's a very good question. Um, first of all, I want to make a, an important distinction, because I've talked about social capital as if it was just connect connectedness, but there are different forms of social connectedness that in this context are really important to distinguish. One important distinction is between what I call bridging social capital, that is connections that link you to people unlike yourself, and bonding social capital, by which I mean simply social connections that link you to people like you. And so one way of asking your question, I don't mean to be changing your question, but one way of asking it is, well, how about Putnam is if what you've just shown is that there's been a decline in bonding social capital made up for by a decline, by an increase in bridging social capital. I no longer belong to the NAACP, but now I can belong to some other kind of organization of people who are not the same as me. Or just even that, I mean, not even that I can join an organization, but that I can now live in Lexington, sure. for example. 
Well, which is an organization, but I have those choices. Sure. Well, well, let me say I, I, I don't disagree for a moment that there's been that there's more choice in America than there was uh, specifically along these issues of, of racial. Uh, lines more choice in America now than there was a generation ago. And I'm not trying to say that everything in America that's happened in the last 30 years are bad. Absolutely not trying to say that. But and so the fact that you could now live in Lexington and it would have been more difficult for you to live in Lexington a generation ago is a a true fact and b a net gain. So I'm not denying that for a second. The, it is important though to ask whether somehow the numbers that I've been talking about here are limited to bonding social capital. That is, is it limited to you know your membership in. The NAACP, and the answer there is no, because what I've been able, what we're able to do here is to look at separate groups in America to see, regardless of the social composition of their groups, do they belong to more groups or not? Do they have dinner at home more often or not? Do they have friends over to the house or not? And all of that evidence shows that the trends down are the same among African Americans as among whites. They're the same among working class people as among middle class people. I mean, I named many of the organizations I named here are middle class, but take labor unions, for example. Labor unions are the most common kind of, or were at least, the most common kind of organizational membership for working class Americans. And they, if I showed you the labor union graph, that would have been even, drop would have been even greater. So it's not that I'm concentrating, sorry? I'm sorry, but like, labor unions aren't as powerful now as they were before. Yeah, but that's, but why? Well, I mean, part of it was like Ronald Reagan, but like, I mean, there's, it seems like. It's no, actually, Ronald Reagan wasn't very much of it. I mean, to be honest with you, look at the numbers. The numbers have been steadily downward, and they follow. Yeah, they're not as powerful. But the reason they're not as powerful, I believe, is because people have stopped joining unions. Okay. I mean, as a concept, you, you correctly have described the fact they're not as powerful, but the reason is because we don't join as much as we used to. It's just merely one more example of. Now, if we could name other important, forget about organizations, other important kinds of social networks that had grown during this period um, that would offset these declines, that would, be, that would be fine. I actually have looked really hard over the last five years. Every, uh, there have been a lot of different suggestions that have been made to me about, well, have you thought about health clubs? Have you thought about reading groups? Have you thought about uh, soccer teams? Have you thought about reading group? I mean, lots of them. And I've looked at all the ones that have been suggested to me, and they're all down. I do want to, however, address the last point, that, I mean, the, the core point, uh, as I see it, of what you made. Could it be that the drops are all in bonding social capital, and there is an increase in bridging social capital in America? And that's possible because we don't have good data over time, but frankly, I don't think so. Because the data on, I mean, there are people here in the room who know the data better than I do, but the data on housing segregation, for example, in America, suggests that housing segregation has not declined, in fact. School segregation has not declined in America over this period. So I don't, of course, deny that there is, there's been a growth of a African-American middle class over this period that is much better connected with broader white society than would have been true a generation ago. I don't disagree with that. It would be crazy to disagree with that. But I don't really think that at the level of society as a whole, we've kind of just switched from old-fashioned bonding organizations to new, exciting bridging organizations. At least I don't yet see what those might be. We can talk maybe later about that. Yes. Um, my name is Felicity Spectre. I'm a television journalist from, from Britain, working at the Kennedy School. And I wanted to ask about the role of television um, and whether that's so much a cause of the decline in social capital or also a victim of it. I'm speaking of um, network news programmes in particular, which have seen their audiences declining almost as rapidly as your memberships of various organisations. I would argue that in, in many cases, the news, the national news is a kind of agenda for the country to agree on what was important today and to discuss afterwards and a shared space to communicate. And even programmes like Survivor become what we call water cooler television when colleagues meet and talk about the same things. They have a, share, a shared culture, if you like, even if it's a popular culture, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, can you not see a role for television as actually something which can mobilise communities, which can galvanise people around issues, which can interest people in national affairs, and that actually we should be arguing that there's good television and bad television, that it's not an ogre to, to pin the blame on in this situation? Well, um, let me concede yes. Or I really remind you that I did say that there were some forms of television, I used Jim Lehrer NewsHour as an example, that are in fact associated with greater civic involvement. So yes, I agree that there are, quote, good forms of television. It's just the good, for, the quote, good forms. By good, I mean here not entertaining. I just mean good in the sense of associated with civic involvement or social connectedness of any sort. The good forms are quite rarely watched. 
and the news hour audience, for example, the news hour, the, the Jim Lehrer news hour, or for that matter, all network news programs, all news programs, period, forget about just network, all news programs are slumping in their readership just as this, just as these other graphs are slumping. So yes, I'm, I'm not opposed to network news, or for that matter, current events programming, but that is actually not what television means in the lives of most Americans. Overwhelmingly, what television means in the lives of most Americans is entertainment television. And I don't agree, actually, that the, the water cooler effects of, of, um, of Survivor, for example, offset the fact that we were spending lots of enormous numbers of hours sitting alone in front of a glowing tube. I don't want to rag on or criticize only Survivor. It's just that's an example that we, we both used. There's a huge amount of time that the net of all the, the research shows that um, what television has done is to bring us home in terms of the, our time, bring us home and increasingly alone. And that, although it provides us with a common vocabulary, doesn't provide us, the water cooler examples of the country notwithstanding, doesn't, doesn't enable us to connect with other real people. The clearest c example of the causal effect of television, actually, causal now, comes from this study that some of you will know about th this, in a way, controlled experiment in Canada in which there were several smallish towns in Western Canada where the sociologists got there before television did, and in which there are three paired towns. One of, at, the beginning they didn't, at the beginning, one of them had television, and the other two didn't because they were in a valley. And then television came, and the sociologists were able to measure what community life was like before television arrived and after television arrived. And they had two towns because one, I mean, there was, it was even neater because one had this, one in one of the towns, CBC arrived, and the other town, CBC plus the American commercial television arrived. And we can then see before and after what happened. And the evidence is quite clear. What happened was social life in the communities where television arrived deteriorated dramatically after the arrival of television. And that's a clear, essentially experimental test because it wasn't that the television came in because they couldn't think of stuff to do. Television came in because they, that's when they built the, the cable to the towns. And, and parenthetically, the CBC was only a little bit better than, or was almost as bad as, as American commercial television. So although I love Masterpiece Theater and other forms of highbrow entertainment, and I watch the news hour religiously, um, it's in, in general civic life is, I think, pretty negatively affected by entertainment television, especially commercial entertainment television. That's my reading of the evidence, at least. Okay, here, unless, am I missing something? I'm sorry, I couldn't see you. Yes, please. My name's Ben Wickler. I'm a sophomore at the college. Yep. Uh, my question concerns income inequality. Yep. Uh, in the post-World War II boom, uh, median and average incomes rose in lockstep, but that link was broken around 1970, and since then inequality has exploded yep. in good times and bad. So I'm wondering whether you think that's a causal factor and how that's linked to declining yes. social capital. I think there's a, there's a clear connection, there's a clear correlation, not just in the example you use, but in general, a clear correlation between income equality and social capital. It's true across nations. The, Nations in the world that have the highest levels of income equality also have the highest levels of social capital. It's true across the American states. The places in America where there's more social capital are also the places with the more egalitarian income distribution. And as you point out, it's true over time. There was rising social capital during the period when there was rising or steady or rising income equality. And the turning point in those two series, the income equality series and the social capital series, are about the same. So there is certainly some connection between income equality or economic equality and social capital. It's not at all clear what that connection is. And I can tell you a story in which the causes run from the income equality to the social capital. That is, that's the story you're sort of implying, that as, as people, as we, as we begin to have a wider and wider gap, people find less and less um, opportunity to connect with one another. I can tell another story, which actually I personally find more plausible, in which it becomes more and more tolerable to have wide income gaps when we don't connect with one another. In other words, I think that to use the language of unionism and of, a, and of, and of uh, the socialist periods of American history, solidarity, social capital, is a prerequisite for political and economic prerequisite for, for greater equality. I'm not trying to say that my story is right and your story is wrong. We both have to, we both are, are on to something here, that there is a connection, a big connection between social capital and equality. 
It's also possible that there's some third factor out there that affects both of them. That, that is, and I mean, like wartime, for example, because most of the gains in equality in, in this in the first part of the century were associated with World War II, actually. So it, it's possible that there's, a, you know, one is the cause, it's possible the other is the cause, it's possible they're both affected by a third factor, but you're definitely on to something. I do, that for that very reason, sometimes people say politically now, talking to me in my, in, in my, in, given my political interests, that the social capital agenda is an alternative to and a distraction from the social justice agenda in American politics today. I completely disagree with that. I think that the social capital agenda and the social justice agenda are simply two sides of the same coin. I don't think we're going to be able politically to sustain major movements to reverse the trends that you've talked about unless we connect more with one another and therefore begin to identify more, with one, more and more with one another. So I, I think that the question you've asked is a central question, not only in terms of social theory, but also in terms of practical political strategy. Yes, sir. We have, Bob, we have time for one more question. Okay. Hi, I'm Fleming Ray, a technology and policy student at MIT. I'm uh, curious if your data takes into account social involvement in corporations, so the athletic clubs that corporations have in-house or team building activities. Yep. And secondly, do you talk at all about quality? You've talked a lot about quantity of social capital, but not, what about quality of interaction? What, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by quality. I, I mean, people talk about quality time versus yeah, quantity of time. I, 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 don't, I don't know how you would think about quality. I mean, I, I've been to boring meetings as well as exciting meetings. Sure. Uh, you, are, you are interesting, so you don't need to go. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, if, but if, all, if all I had was 12 boring meetings a year and I only went to six of them, uh, the next year I think that would be an improvement. It might be. Um, no, um, let me say something about the first question, which is uh, workplace social capital. And then I'll say something about the quality time uh, issue. Um, I spent a lot of time in writing the book looking at the possibility that we had not simply stopped having social capital or we'd had a loss, but it had just moved from you know, community to the workplace. And I looked really hard to find evidence that might show growing connectedness at the workplace. Some of the examples you made, uh, that you suggested, are simply wrong. It's, there's, been, there's been a substantial decline in workplace-sponsored athletic activities. Decline in workplace-sponsored. Bowling leagues, for example, are, are, were used to be sponsored. But I mean, that's just an example. Um, and you can tell stories in both directions. It's true that there's a lot more talk now about team building in in corporate settings than there used to be. On the other hand, it's also true that the levels of suspicion in the workplace have risen, not, f not fallen over this period. So some people might think that the work team building was just kind of a um, cover for downsizing and so on, things that had, and, and, and there are other reasons for believing that actually our social connections at work are less good than the social connections we used to have at work a generation ago. For example, uh, job mobility is up a lot People are moving around more from job to job, partly because of involuntary, n n not only involuntary, but partly, and that we know is associated with cuts in social capital. You're less likely to have friends if you don't stay around long enough to have friends in the same job. I don't want to say that I know the trends are down in so workplace-based social capital, but I at least satisfied myself that they weren't up enough in, in, in the workplace. And there isn't any evidence there. I mean, there's any systematic evidence that I was able to find, having gone looking for it. For example, job satisfaction net over this period is slightly down, not up. You wanted to? I guess the, the only data I have that is I know a lot of the startups, the biotech and infotech ones, sponsor like corporate picnics on Fridays. But I mean, I don't know. I don't think that they employ a lot of people as yeah, a percentage exactly. of the I mean, U.S. Yeah, I, so. um, it's. Sh I don't deny for a second that there are places in America where there, are, and and maybe the dot-com startups or biotech startups are an example of that, where people are paying more attention to social capital, and indeed. To some extent, I welcome that, because after all, I'm trying to fix the problem, not trying to just complain about it or kvetch about it. So um, to the extent that we can do more workplace social capital building, I'm all in favor of it. I do think actually myself that, it's, that the bigger strategy is not to try to build social capital in the workplace. I'm all in favor of that. But I think that actually a more important strategy will try to be, will be to dramatically increase the flexibility of our work lives, dramatically increase the flexibility of our work lives in order to enable us to fit together our own social connecting wherever we choose to connect, whether at work or, or at home, with our work obligations. Because, let me see if I can put the point this way. 
um, and I know that I'm running close to over time here, but I, this is an important issue, that I think that we have not yet assimilated the fact in our workplace structures that most adults now work outside the home. We still, our workplace structure, the nine to five and the Friday, Monday to Friday and so on, is predicated on the assumption that everybody has a wife, I mean a housewife, but most of us don't have housewives. And I'm not trying to say it would be great if we did. Don't, please don't misunderstand me. I'm trying to say it's, we, we assume that everybody has somebody else who's doing the, the family and, and community building. That isn't true now. And we haven't yet, we still think of that, let me put it this way, we still think of the problems of reconciling our workplace and our family and community life as your individual problem, not our problem. We think about who's going to pick up the kids tonight, not how is America going to take care of its kids. And we need, in my view, a dramatic cultural change in which we recognize that this is a shared problem and in which there's, you know, if we were mainly working in industries, we, you couldn't say, well, I'm going to do my hubcaps between, you know, 10 and 6 on, on, uh, on Sunday mornings. But now we can do a lot more shifting of our, we can be a lot more flexible technically, and we have not yet begun to do that. So the short answer to your question is, I don't think team building is such a solution to our problem, but I do think dramatically, and, and the work and the, the Thai tech are good in the, in the second area that I'm talking about, make, make in workplace flexibility such that we can, we, can, we can have choice. I'm not saying that everybody, therefore, everybody should have to show up at, at, at you know, the church choir or something on Thursday. I'm saying just allow us to choose more in a way that we can't now. Uh, how we how we spend our connecting time. Um, sorry, the last part of your question I will answer quickly, but I'm, I've lost it, which was? Quality. Oh, quality. You know, I think that quality time is a term that was invented to hide from ourselves the fact that time matters. The notion that five minutes with your six-year-old is the same as five hours with your six-year-old when you just do it more intensely is fooling ourselves. Quality time is a label that allows us to imagine that there's not a problem when there really is. I'm not only talking about uh, dads with uh, kids, although that's the, that's the context in which the term most often appears. Um, I, of course, you can imagine that there has been a systematic move toward more boring meetings in America, though I doubt that, actually. I go to some pretty boring meetings uh, now. Um, and I think that the, the, I think that the notion that all of the changes, the declines in going to bar, the declines in going to picnics, and the declines in having friends over to the house, and, the, and, all, and, all, and as well as organizational meetings, and the decline in social trust, um, which is off by a lot, um, makes me skeptical about, or adds to my skepticism about the idea that we've made up with quality what we've lost in terms of quantity. Thank you all very much. I'd like, I'd like to thank Bob and encourage you not only to buy his book, but to read it with a friend. <laughs>